Well, we turn now to the housing crisis. Recent census data reveals the home ownership rate for African Americans has fallen to its lowest level since before the civil rights movement. In the second quarter of this year, the rate fell to just 40 percent, the lowest level since 1950. A new book by Kianga Yamata Taylor examines the roots of this crisis. It's titled Race for Profit How Banks and the Real Estate Industry Undermine Black Home Ownership. The book has just come out, it's been long listed for the 2019 National Book Award. Kianga Yamata Taylor is an assistant professor at Princeton University. She's joining us from Philadelphia. Welcome back to Democracy Now!, Kianga. Um, when you talk about black home ownership, you can also link this to um, African American wealth and the difference between wealth and income. Talk about why you decided to write your book, Race for Profit. Well, <clears throat> thanks, a a Amy and Juan, for uh, having me on. Um, I wanted to really understand um, why racism in the housing market uh, continues even after the passage of fair housing. So a lot of um, histories recently, and even in the uh, popular media, uh, have focused on the role of the Federal Housing Administration in creating, um, uh, perpetuating residential segregation, um, and really as offering an explanation for uh, the disproportionate rates of home ownership between African Americans um, and white Americans. And, it, you know, it's been pretty consequential to trying to understand uh, this thing called the racial wealth gap um, that most people have concluded is rooted in the disparities between uh, access to home ownership. Um, but I was, you know, and so the history tends to stop uh, around 1968 when the Fair Housing Act um, was passed. And, you know, one of the, the questions that I often uh, encounter as someone who teaches uh, about the history of housing discrimination is what happened after that. And so, you know, I wanted to, to really look at why, even after the federal government stops its practices of redlining, um, does racism uh, persist. And one of the things that uh, I try to, to, to look at in the book is how um, the, the federal government doesn't really uh, upend the uh, the consequences of segregation. It just says, you know, from this point on, uh, segregation is not legal without actually dealing uh, with the, the issues that precipitate at that moment. Um, and the conditions that are created after decades of disinvestment, uh, neglect, um, exclusion and isolation uh, really become the, the basis upon which uh, lenders and uh, the real estate industry in total treat black consumers differently. Um, and the result is that uh, for African Americans, even those who are able to access home ownership, um, that it's done on different terms, uh, that it's more expensive, um, that it is typically confined to a market um, that is seen to have less value. So even those black people who are able to purchase a home it comes to mean something different than uh, it does uh, for their white peers, where uh, the house has become an asset that accrues in value uh, over time. Often for African Americans, it becomes a debt burden um, <clears throat> and not an accruing asset uh, for which uh, that which can be uh, passed on to their um, children. So. I'm, I was interested in looking at why these patterns of inequality continue to exist, even when the law is formally changed. Well, uh, in your book, obviously, you go through the uh, you refer to the earlier periods of the 30s, 40s, and 50s when you really, in essence, had a, a, a dual market. You had a private market uh, for home ownership, and then you had the federal government, especially after uh, uh, for as part of the New Deal, building public housing, uh, uh, largely even then segregated, uh, white public housing and, and black public housing. Uh, but then in around the 70s, you get all the rise of these public private partnerships. And uh, and then you, you talk about what happens, especially in the 70s, in cities like Philadelphia, Detroit, St. Louis, and others, uh, with yep. the failures of the federal government's attempts to promote home ownership among African Americans. I'm wondering if you could expound on that. Sure. I mean, I think that the popularity of public-private partnerships 
uh, really derive from the, the Johnson administration. I mean, there's a whole uh, entire history of the uh, private sector in collaboration with uh, uh, the federal government to, you know, do everything from build uh, railroads to um, uh, to its original home ownership programs in the 1930s. So that aspect isn't new. Um, but there is a, a the, the, the newness of the programs that I look at are the ways that these partnerships are used to uh, build uh, and produce um, low-income housing. But what is different um, with the Johnson administration is that it's caught between uh, the bind of Vietnam, um, and the pressures at, at home, uh, the uh, mass rebellions that happened throughout the 1960s, um, and to avoid uh, a larger deficit even uh, becoming even larger, um, Johnson engages in uh, these partnerships with the real estate and banking industries uh, to kind of shift the production of uh, low-income housing, whether it's home ownership or whether it's rentals, um, <clears throat> to the private sector. And there are all sorts of problems with that. I mean, the, the main one is that uh, it's the real estate and banking industries that have been largely responsible uh, for the uh, dearth of good, affordable, safe and sound housing in African-American communities in the first place. And so what does it mean, then, for the federal government to partner with these institutions uh, for which race—racism uh, and racial discrimination has been so critical uh, to its bottom line um, in the first place, keeping white neighborhoods exclusively white um, and keeping black people locked in deteriorating and dilapidated uh, uh, housing? And because of segregation um, and the enclosure that it, uh, it ensures means that black people have very few options and, in many ways, are a captured uh, audience. And so what does it mean for the federal government to then empower, um, with its resources, mortgage guarantees and subsidies, this particular sector? Um, and I think that there's a more fundamental problem that uh, I definitely locate in, in my research, which is that these are there are two really opposing set of uh, objectives here, um, where you have private uh, real estate corporations um, and banks that are primarily interested in making money. Why is there no real affordable housing in the United States? Why is this a perennial problem that has never been solved? Because there's no money in creating affordable housing for poor and working class people. There's no money to be made. So the, when that is left to the private sector uh, to fulfill, you know, it always comes up short, because there's there's no money to be made in, in housing uh, those uh, kinds of people. Um, <clears throat> so you have the profit motive from uh, the, the, the private sector, but then, you know, what is the uh, uh, public policy for? It's to promote public welfare. And so these are two opposing goals, profiteering and public welfare. And to put them together uh, erupts into, you know, a million different kinds of contradictions that play themselves out um, in these programs. And, and the, the, one of the biggest problems that emerge is then the inability of the federal government to actually uh, enforce its own civil rights laws, uh, to uh, aggressively regulate um, its programs. Because, you know, if you're in partnership with these uh, uh, entities and the federal government itself has divested uh, from creating housing, from producing housing, managing it uh, on its own on a nonprofit basis, then and, and, and has become completely reliant on the private sector uh, to produce this housing, then it makes it difficult uh, to police and punish its private partners um, when they begin to engage in fraudulent and, and corrupt practices. And so all down the line, um, I found conflicts of interest and contradictions that could not be overcome uh, in these policies. And the result, uh, you know, are a series of uh, not just failed programs, but uh, a host of uh, tens of thousands of foreclosures that are centered um, in African-American working-class uh, communities that then work to devalue the uh, surrounding properties, um, and that a generation later become the, the basis upon which uh, these communities and the people who live in them are declared to be subprime. We're talking to Princeton professor Kianga Yamata-Taylor, uh, whose book is just out. It's called Race for Profit. You quote 
President Nixon, who famously said, if they own their own homes, they won't burn the cities down. Um, so you talk about the shift away from um, excluding black Americans from home ownership in the 60s and early 70s. Um, and you say that um, racist, ex racist exclusion gave way to predatory inclusion. Explain what you mean. Sure. <clears throat> I think that a basic tenet um, of liberalism in the period after the Second World War, really through the 1960s um, into the early 1970s, is that America is basically a good society. Uh, the problems that uh, African Americans are facing uh, is one that comes from exclusion. That essentially, if black people are included into the same institutions uh, that have produced this enormous white middle class uh, after the Second World War, um, then those institutions can play the same role in black communities. So the problem is exclusion, and all we need is is inclusion. Um, and the the the, the problem for for that outlook is that <clears throat> it doesn't actually allow us to understand the institutions that. Uh, we are suggesting black people be integrated um, into. And so, from the, the purview of, of housing, um, the problems with this idea of uh, sh just shifting from exclusion to inclusion um, become, uh, become very clear. And so, I describe the inclusion of African Americans into uh, conventional real estate practices and uh, mortgage banking um, is predatory. And it's really a way to understand uh, how the previous period impacts uh, the, the, the contemporary moment, meaning that uh, the decades of disinvestment, um, of uh, racist exclusion of African Americans from uh, the conventional real estate market, uh, you know, create a, a tremendous amount of distress uh, uh, in, in black communities, it is at the root of the substandard housing um, in black communities. Uh, and those become the basis upon which, uh, even when African Americans are included, for them to be treated uh, differently, for them to be uh, 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 seen as more risky. Um, and the whole notion of risk uh, gives the banks and real estate uh, industry uh, a, an excuse to charge African Americans more, uh, to sub subject them to uh, less secure um, banking methods, all of which end up putting African Americans in, uh, um, uh, making them vulnerable to new predatory um, practices that aren't exactly like the the, the previous uh, examples, like you know the use of contracts uh, in lieu of conventional mortgages. Um, in Chicago is one example. So they're not quite that way. Um, but it means that, you know, African Americans have to rely on uh, unregulated mortgage banks as opposed to uh, commercial banks with, um, you know, better interest rates uh, and uh, a better situation overall. Um, so it's really trying to uh, look critically at the institutions and practices themselves and not just uh, whether or not African Americans are present and able to actively um, participate. We need to look at the institutions uh, themselves and the practices themselves to determine um, whether or not this is the, uh, the, the, the best way to uh, increase social mobility uh, for black people. I wanted to ask you, you begin uh, your book with uh, one uh, home buyer, Janice Johnson, in 1970, uh, uh, trying to get a, a mortgage, an FHA mortgage. You live uh, uh, in Philadelphia, and Philadelphia was really actually the epicenter of the FHA yeah. crisis of the 1970s. I remember I lived there in the 1970s, and I, there were about 35,000 wow. abandoned homes, uh, federally owned abandoned homes and a huge squatters movement developed, led by Milton Street and John Street, Henry de Bernardo, the Puerto Rican Alliance, and others, wow. to reclaim those homes. How did that happen? How did so many homes, federally insured by the government, uh, all end up really paving the way for gentrification? Because once all those people were expelled from the inner cities, that's when the massive gentrification movements began in many of those cities. 
Well, the way that the, the programs that, that I look at work, so they, they're created by the 1968 Housing and Urban Development Act. And the most well-known, there are two programs that are probably the, uh, were the most prolifically used in a city like Philadelphia, uh, Section 235 of the 68 Act and Section 221 D2 uh, of the, the 68 Act. Um, Section 235 was a program that allowed uh, people um, to pay $200 as a down payment. The mortgage was 20 percent of their income, so not the value of the house, and interest rates were capped at 1 percent. Um, and the, the, the issue that made this all uh, operational was that the federal government, for the first time, stepped in and said, we will insure the mortgages um, of uh, all of these homes that are purchased under uh, the terms of these programs in the inner city for the first time. Uh, and so what mortgage insurance meant, the FHA wasn't lending money, but it, it told the banks that if someone defaults or goes into foreclosure, we will pay the loan off. And it essentially removed all the risk from, uh, from the banking industry. And this really helped to crack wide open uh, the urban housing market in, in completely unprecedented uh, ways. And so now you have speculators who are coming in, um, who are buying up properties, many of which had already been uh, condemned, uh, or they were in a, a very uh, poor condition. Um, they do a, a cheap uh, rehab, which often just in involved uh, a quick coat of paint, um, and they would flip them. Uh, to poor uh, and working-class families that were desperate for housing. Um, and one of the things that I look at in, in the book is the way that um, black mothers, uh, black women uh, who were living in public housing, uh, who were welfare recipients, were particularly targeted um, by the, the, the real estate partners in this um, program uh, on the, the, the hope that they would go into default and that they would foreclose, um, because the, the, the banks were making their money not just uh, because the, the loans were insured, uh, but they made their money uh, for every loan uh, that they secured um, and on the closing costs uh, of selling the house in the first place. And so the more foreclosures, the more that they could take the same house that was in poor condition uh, and sell it and repeat this process over uh, and over again. And so many of these families, when they'd move into these homes, uh, within a matter of weeks and months, realizing that they were um, in such deep disrepair uh, and themselves being on extremely fixed incomes, would just walk away. Uh, and so the, the HUD programs were not uh, the, the, the basis for all of the abandonment. Um, in, in cities during this time. There are a lot of different factors that include uh, the outmigration of, of, of whites, uh, that include the, the beginnings of the movement of uh, some African Americans to uh, the suburban uh, periphery. So there are many different pressures that uh, are existing uh, within the, the, uh, the housing market in neighborhoods um, at this time. But the, the, the role of, of HUD can't be underestimated, because one of the issues that arises is that as these properties, um, some of many of which the, the value has been inflated because uh, HUD has hired part-time real estate uh, agents as appraisers who—it's a low-wage job, they are susceptible to bribes, um, uh, real estate agents bribe them to inflate the value uh, of the homes. And so, when these houses go back to HUD, they can't be resold because they've been overvalued. Um, and so that is why HUD's housing re reserves become so large. And so what they do is they start selling, uh, having open auctions for these houses, selling them for anywhere between a dollar and a hundred dollars, which then invites speculators to come back in to buy the houses and to begin the process all over again. Um, so even if HUD wasn't responsible for all of the uh, abandonment issues that are happening in the cities uh, at this time, um, these actions certainly weren't aren't helpful. And I'm wondering also, uh, there are some uh, housing advocates who, uh, especially in the African American and Latino community, who have claimed for years that there was a political purpose as well as a racial uh, a racial bias uh, in federal housing policy. Uh, they point to the 
the 1974, I think, Community Development Act that specifically set out a goal of spatial deconcentration yes. of the inner city. Uh, to in, in essence, because there were, as you pointed out, the, the government was so worried about the uh, uh, riots and and uh, unrest in the inner city that there was a political project to remove African Americans and Latinos from the inner city. Uh, in, in, in essence, to defuse uh, the danger to urban America. Well, there certainly was a debate about it. I don't think that there was a, a, a consensus um, position. Even you look in the uh, within the Nixon administration, uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, um, the the mysterious liberal who ends up in you know the, coming up with all of these conservative positions and then is an advisor to Richard Nixon, definitely uh, favored a uh, political project of deconcentration, meaning uh, the uh, pushing African Americans into uh, the suburbs at a moment when uh, black people are concentrated um, in cities, which for the first time becomes uh, the basis of political power. Uh, and this is coincides with what we see as the emergence of uh, uh, the black political class and black elected um, of officials, uh, new mayors, uh, uh, African Americans being voted uh, to, to, to Congress, the um, Congressional Black Caucus forms informally in 1969 and formally in 1971. So this is all happening at this time. But for someone like Nixon, um, there's a problem, uh, which is that, you know, he has spent uh, the, the first term of his administration carefully uh, uh, curating uh, uh, the coalition of um, disaffected, angry uh, white suburban homeowners. Um, and part of the appeal that he makes to them is that, I will keep your neighborhoods and communities uh, white. Um, and so there is a big uh, debate about where, because one of the things that the HUD Act does is that uh, it mandates Congress to produce 26 million uh, units of new uh, and used housing, reha rehabilitated housing, within a 10-year period. And so one of the big dates, debates that emerge is, well, where, where will this housing go? It's very expensive to build uh, in cities because of insurance costs, because of land costs. Um, and so this means that, you know, uh, to keep this housing uh, cheap and where there is plenty of space, it should be built in suburbs. White people in the suburbs don't want uh, uh, affordable housing, low-income housing in their communities, because they know that that will uh, uh, bring African Americans into those neighborhoods. Within black politics, there's a debate uh, among those who see uh, the, the potential for uh, the development of black politics and black elected officials uh, based on the concentration of black people in cities. But black people in search of housing know that, as a captured market uh, within the city, that it limits their housing choices, it places downward pressure on the conditions uh, of the housing and upward pressure uh, on the price of housing when they are confined to one aspect uh, of the market. So many African-American, working class uh, and poor African-Americans, want housing wherever uh, they can secure it. Um, so all of that is to say that this is this is a highly contested issue where African Americans uh, should live, both from white conservatives um, uh, and white political operatives, but also within the black community itself. Princeton University professor Kianga Yamata Taylor, author of the new book *Race for Profit: How Banks and the Real Estate Industry Undermined Black Ownership*. Um, Michelle Alexander said of your book, "A Horror Story of Racial Capitalism." So I wanted to turn to 2020 presidential ca uh, candidate Bernie Sanders. Um, massive turnout this weekend, the biggest of any rally uh, this year for president. Uh, Bernie's back rally in. Queensbridge, New York, 26,000 people um, came out to Queens. But last Tuesday, um, when he in, uh, was uh, in the debate, CNN host Aaron Burnett questioned Sanders about his wealth tax proposal. Senator Sanders, when you introduced your wealth tax, which would tax the assets of the wealthiest Americans, you said, quoting you, Senator, billionaires should not exist. Is the goal of your plan to tax billionaires out of existence? When you have a half a million Americans sleeping out on the street today, when you have 87 people, 87 million people uninsured or underinsured, when you got hundreds of thousands of kids who cannot afford to go to college and millions, 
struggling with the oppressive burden of student debt. And then you also have three people owning more wealth than the bottom half of American society. That is a moral and economic outrage. And the truth is, we cannot afford to continue this level of income and wealth inequality, and we cannot afford a billionaire class whose greed and corruption has been at war with the working families of this country for 45 years. So if you are asking me, do I think we should demand that the wealthy start paying the wealthiest, top one-tenth of one percent, start paying their fair share of taxes so we can create a nation and a government that works for all of us Yes, that's exactly what I believe. So that's Bernie Sanders. Professor Kianga Yamata-Taylor, your response to his wealth tax and not only his plan for housing and that connection between wealth and homelessness in this country, the vast inequality uh, that is only growing here, um, the plans of other candidates as well. Yeah, I mean, that is— that is why Bernie Sanders has, you know, 26,000 people uh, coming out to, to hear him speak. That is why, despite the uh, strange media, you know, brownout of, of, of Sanders, the underreporting um, on the significance of his campaign, uh, he continues to raise more money uh, from uh, uh, many more donors. Um, most of whom are uh, the, you know, working-class people that he was referencing uh, in his response uh, uh, on CNN. He is absolutely right. Um, billionaires are an obscenity uh, in a society that experiences the crushing, uh, crushing amount of uh, uh, wealth inequality. Uh, within um, this country that is absolutely inexcusable in the richest country, um, really in the history of in the history of the world, and and Sanders' campaign continues to be buoyed, uh, I think, by by continuing to to come back um, to this point. And it's not you know it's not just the the question uh, of the the wealth tax, which I think is incredibly uh, important and, and is at the root of so many of. Uh, our issues, the, the absolute reluctance and fear of elected—the the, the entire political class, regardless of, of party, of taxing the rich, uh, of taking uh, uh, back our money that, uh, you know, goes to line the pockets of the rich, uh, to use for uh, the, the, the social needs, the desperate social needs um, across this country. And for him to come out and say that uh, forthrightly uh, is why people are so attracted and drawn um, to his campaign. Uh, his willingness to accept the anger and hatred of the billionaire class um, on the behalf of uh, working and poor people um, in this country. And it's not just on that issue. If you look across Sanders' platform, um, these are policies, if implemented, that would transform the lives of poor and working-class people, a disproportionate number of whom, I might add, are African American and Latino. Um, and so I think that uh, uh, this is, you know, bringing to light uh, the connection between uh, the systemic forces that drive inequality uh, and the impact that they have in people's lives. And so, uh, for something like housing, I think it shows how uh, Sanders' connection uh, to the social movements, to the people on the ground, uh, then get reflected in the policies that he proposes. Sanders is the only uh, 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 candidate who mentions, uh, within the Democratic field, who mentions in any meaningful way ending segregation, housing segregation, as a political objective. No one else talks about that. I mean, people accept the segregation in our cities almost as a natural phenomenon uh, uh, of life, almost as, a, as an expression of nature itself. And Sanders repeatedly, through his housing plan, talks about uh, the, the, the crisis of segregation and the policies that need to be implemented to actually begin to grapple uh, uh, with this issue that deal mostly with rigorous, uh, uh, aggressive enforcement and a ruthless punishment uh, uh, for those um, within uh, real estate and banking who continue to engage um, in these practices. And I think that kind of forthrightness, that kind of clarity, uh, exists throughout Bernie Sanders' um, platform. 
Uh, and the, 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 the other part of it, which I think is so critical, is his understanding that we actually need more than a plan. Plans are good. It's good to have an analysis. It's good to understand why this inequality uh, exists, and it's good to call it out, as he and, and, and Elizabeth Warren have done. But it's not enough just to have a plan. We need a social movement. And I think Bernie Sanders understands that more than any other uh, uh, candidate uh, that's running. That's what he means when he talks about uh, the political revolution. Uh, that's what AOC means when she comes out and endorses him uh, and says that she wants to be a part of the, the political movement that can make these plans, these platforms actually come uh, to life. Because we know, and Bernie Sanders knows, he could be elected president tomorrow. And if we don't have a mass movement on the ground to actually force the Congress that is full of millionaires, that is full of people who have gotten fat and lazy on the status quo, if we don't have a mass movement to force them to listen to us and to implement new policies that actually will improve the quality of life for people on the ground, it won't happen. And so this is this We're is a gonna critical have to leave it intervention there. that Sanders is and making. And we thank you so much sure. for being with us. We're going to do part two about five years after Black Lives Matter. Kianga Yamata Taylor, her new book, Race for Profit. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Thanks so much for joining us.